With the success of the N64 prequel, HAL Laboratory and Masahiro Sakurai were both tasked with the sequel to the N64 classic Super Smash Bros. that wasn't just supposed to be bigger and better, but to also show the power of the GameCube. With only 13 months of rigorous development, this task was met handedly with a breathtaking FMV opening, a large roster, a whole lot of modes and extras, and of course, a lot of cut content and concepts. So today on Cut Content, we look at the beta unused content of Super Smash Bros. Melee. Before we begin, please hit that subscribe button and turn your notifications on to help us further grow this channel and keep providing you with more content. But the biggest upgrade that this sequel got was the sheer number of new fighters going from 12 to 26 fighters. Even with that number, there was still a number of characters that were considered uncut. The first one is Sonic the Hedgehog. It was strongly considered according to the former head of the Sonic team, Yuji Naka, but time constraints didn't allow for him to be made. No surprise, since the Dreamcast was discontinued midway through development here. Next up is Lucas from Mother 3. Lucas in this case was going to replace Ness, and was going to be based on the Mother 3 that was being developed for the 64 disk drive, as opposed to the GBA that wasn't made yet. Ultimately, he was dropped upon the cancellation of Mother 3 on the N64. The next one is Wario, an obvious contender who Sakurai wanted to be in the game, but time constraints kept him from developing Wario to the point where Sakurai said it would have been his next character had he had just a little bit more time. That's why he came back in a rather nuclear fashion in the first Brawl trailer. Next is a character for the retro slot, which in the final game was taken up by the Ice Climbers. But during development, Sakurai considered a number of characters for that slot, including Bloon Fighter, Bubbles from Clue Clue Land, Excite Bike Racer, and even the very obscure Ayumi Tachibana from the Famicom Detective Club. The latter was especially considered too niche for the Western market, and in the end settled for the Ice Climbers in this retro slot. But in the end, while a lot of these characters never made it in, a good deal found their way into the sequel at least. Now, some like to toss in Solid Snake, Banjo and Kazooie, and James Bond as supposed cut characters, but these were never considered. All Sakurai ever said was that Solid Snake was requested by Hideo Kojima, but instantly rejected for being too late into development. And Banjo and Kazooie, and especially James Bond, were never considered because of a plethora of copyright issues. But relating to characters overall, one thing that always baffled me was lack of character animations when selecting a character like the Super Smash Bros. 64 game. Well, seems like it was indeed going to be a thing still in this game too. In the data of the game exist two animations for every character, some of which resemble the victory poses. The data, however, suggests that these were going to be on the character select screen as one is labeled as selected and the other as selected weight. When hacked back in, it functions as it should, though some characters clearly don't have finished animations yet and easily clip through their bounding box. But that's not the only character animation cut. As famously known, Ganondorf is a clone of Captain Falcon, meaning he carried over his entire moveset, but with some alterations made along the way. However, there is an unused animation for Ganondorf. Normally, unlike Captain Falcon, Ganondorf doesn't have a second jab when pressing neutral A twice. But in version 1.0 of the game, if he wears the bunny hood, he uses that animation. However, it has no hitbox, meaning it does not make any impact or damage. But aside from the playable characters, both Master Hand and Crazy Hand were supposed to have an additional team attack where they would have grabbed the player together. It's incomplete, however, but putting it back in the game does make it work to an extent. But speaking of enemy characters, much like Smash 64 with its robust debug menu, Melee also had a rather in-depth debug menu, though unfortunately lacking Cube Kirby. But like its N64 counterpart, it lets you play as numerous characters you were never meant to play as, including Master Hand and Crazy Hand, both having a complex set of attacks mapped to the D-pad including their combo attacks. Unlike the N64 debug menu, Master Hand is a lot more restricted as he can't move and only attacks from where he's floating. Also pressing Y plus left on Crazy Hand freezes the game as that's where the grab move that was mentioned earlier was removed. 
Much like Smash 64's version, they were never meant to be playable characters considering in any match they would have a percentage bar and you cannot knock them out of the stage and doesn't exactly fit in every level either like how they are at the bottom of the castle level here. As well we have a playable Giga Bowser, to which functions exactly like Bowser but bigger and stronger. No real differences here otherwise. Both the wireframe male and female are playable here too, much like the polygon fighters were in Smash 64's debug menu. And much like them, they have limited abilities including no special attacks, no chargeable smash attacks, no electric or flame effects, and are weaker clones of Captain Falcon and Zelda. And the weirdest one here being the sandbag. While it normally is seen in home run contests where you beat it to a pulp and it does nothing, here it actually has some abilities. It can move, jump and even shield, which might indicate that it might have been more of a challenge at one point in setting it up to do the home run contest. Likely these abilities were not used and it would have made it a tad too difficult to do this. Also for those who are curious, pressing any of the attack buttons do freeze the game. The biggest thing to note about these is that any character that had a damage meter in the game was given a moveset and accessible via the debug menu as a way for the developers to test and weren't ever meant for a player to use considering how different and unusable they'd be in the base game. But being in the debug menu, we also have access to a chunk of unused and cut stages. The first one to note is a stage called Acania, which to my fellow Fire Emblem fans would be known in the west as Arcanea, which is the nation that the Marth games take place in. Considering he was in the game and even had his own stage music, it only made sense for him to have a stage, but strangely enough it ended up being the only series without one. Sakurai has confirmed on the melee site about the existence of this very stage in fact, and how it would have had catapults that would launch stones at the castle, along with a dragon and a summoner appearing. Likely may have been cut due to time constraints, and their default stage ends up being shared with Link on the temple level. Unlike the Fire Emblem characters, it seems the Ice Climbers were definitely getting the royal treatment as Sakurai may have had another stage planned for them. In the data exists a level labeled as 10-2 and Ice Top. Once again on the Melee website, Sakurai confirmed there was another Ice Climber stage planned. Trying to load either stages crashes the game, but at force to load it, it loads a version of Icicle Mountain without music. Likely were there as placeholders until the stage was made. Ice Top, by the name alone, would assume it's the top of the mountain that is being climbed in Icicle Mountain. In fact, the level in Brawl known as Summit might have actually been this very level that Sakurai was planning here, as he does tend to reuse scrapped ideas in future games. 10-2, however, seems to indicate it was going to be a follow-up to 10-1, which was the level name to the Adventure Mode version of Icicle Mountain. So 10-2 may have just been the Ice Top version of Adventure Mode. Then we got this ridiculously large level that would make 8 player Smash levels proud, appropriately named Test, as yes, this is obviously a test map and much like the test maps from Smash 64, which had random platforms and shapes all over the place, this one does too, and to a much larger degree. The biggest note of interest here is the background, which is an image of the one standing Cafe Verona in Palo Alto, California, that fully forms the cube of the skybox here. A common background used in 3D graphics programs, in fact. And of course, we got a truly incomplete level here, which was going to be a break the targets level that was to be exclusive to Sheik. Which looks very simple here, and clearly unfinished as Sheik doesn't even have to move left or right to complete it. An otter level exists here, known as Dummy. Again a map we likely weren't meant to access here, it is completely black, with one invisible platform in the middle. Though when loading it, the starting points tosses characters to the side, meaning you fall off the stage, but the kill boundaries are so far off that you keep falling for a very long time. Considering the placement of the platform, it is possible that this is the stage that was to be used for the victory screen. It's not in the data of the game, but one additional stage was planned from Pokemon Gold and Silver, known as the Sprout Tower, which had a wobbling platform at the center of the tower. I imagine it might have been either a floor of it with the center platform wobbling, or a scrolling level where you would climb the tower. Now one mysterious stage is this one which has Samus fighting the Ice Climbers in this beta screenshot. The stage looks heavily like the rest zone of All Stars mode, where you never fight anyone in fact. 
In fact, if you pan the camera to the side of the rest area, it looks almost exactly the same. Maybe you were originally supposed to fight the characters in the rest area originally. But aside from cut stages, a number of stages also saw alterations, including the Fountain of Dreams, which originally only had two platforms as opposed to three. Foresight, originally only having black and white buildings and no colorful ones. The Great Bay's Laboratory, which was originally part of the stage and could be climbed and entered too. The Final Games version pushed this to the background and made it non-interactable. Though, if you use a camera tool, you can go inside the lab and see the leftovers, including tiled floors and this spiffy wheel here. Green Greens also had a more realistic design as opposed to the final one that's more Kirby themed. Jungle Japes also had a different background with grey floors. Icicle Mountain is the real fun one here, with it being more of a localization change to reflect the original Ice Climbers localization changes. Where the Japanese version had these seal topies, while in the west we had these yeti topies. The change being done due to how hitting seals with a hammer might look like seal clubbing, which is rather frowned upon. The Mushroom Kingdom level looked more like its N64 counterpart, with the warp pipe still being there. The Pokemon Stadium also had differences with its screen. Not only the matches stats are listed on the screen here, but nothing is here, which may be cause it was in development, but this screenshot shows a fire energy here. Maybe it reflected the stage's condition at times? Rainbow Cruise was also a lot duller, being more cloudier with a darker design and a different ship design. Originally, the temple stage also had a bunch of platforms off to the right, which can still be seen in the special movie found in the game's data menu still. Yoshi's Island also had a considerable amount of differences, with the inclusion of rotating blocks in the middle of the stage, an overall larger stage, and the gap in the middle having music notes to be able to jump on. And Yoshi's Story had a very different design, featuring three areas much like the Mushroom Kingdom 2 level, but larger and had two platforms in the middle along with these two notches that look to control the path of where these platforms move if hit. But of course, what comes in any stage, unless you're a tourney player at all times, are items. And we got a few differences and cuts here too. First is the motion sensor bomb, which is a regional difference. In the West, it uses the circular grey design from GoldenEye 007, but Japan's version uses the design from Perfect Dark, which has a more green and more pentagon shape to it. A real bizarre change considering copyright laws are more stricter here normally. Which brings us to a cut timed mine item, which is from GoldenEye 2, but was cut in all regions for copyright reasons. A real oddity here. A big one, however, was from the Pokeball item where you would normally summon a Ditto. It's still in the data too and can be activated from the debug menu. However, he does nothing when brought out, but his function would have been similar to what he does in Smash Ultimate, where he duplicates the player who brought him out and joins in on the fight. One of these was going to be Sukupon from Joy Mech Fight, which the player could ride if summoned, but was dropped due to adult matters, whatever that means. And segueing to regular trophies, a few were cut from the game. I mentioned the regional changes between the motion sensor bomb and the topies. Well, the Japanese counterpart did use the perfect dark proximity bomb in place of the GoldenEye counterpart and the sealed topies instead of the Yeti topies in the trophy versions too. But the major cut ones include two trophies which could be attained through a special event in Japan and thus is cut for us in the West. This includes a trophy for Mario riding Yoshi, referencing this fun sacrificial move that was done here. And of course, an unmasked Samus was here too. But one trophy was cut out for censorship reasons in the west, and it was a trophy called Tamagon, which likely was cut out due to the fact that it was from a game called Devil World, which Nintendo, and not wanting religion involved in their games at the time, didn't want Devil mentioned in there too. Oddly enough, it's still fully in the data, fully in English too, and the name of the game was even changed from Devil World to Demon World, but still not accessible in the West. Aside from these, more Fire Emblem and Rareware trophies were planned, but Fire Emblem ones didn't happen due to their complexity, and Rare trophies didn't happen because of copyright reasons. But aside from that, a few pieces of cut audio exist. A lot are grunts and simple beta jingles, but a lot of noteworthy ones exist too, including <laughs> which is literally the laugh of a boo from Mario 64, but based on the file name was going to be used for Tingle in the Great Bay. 
even though he has his own laugh in Majora's Mask. <laughs> then we got... Mama! Which is literally Ditto's voice that we mentioned earlier, where he says his Japanese name. Remember the cut final smashes of Smash Bros 64? Well, they also exist in Melee 2. A little background for those who don't know. But Sakurai was planning to have final smashes in this series as early as Smash 64, and then attempted it again in Melee. All we have are audio that indicates its existence, but unlike Smash 64, only Captain Falcons exists here for sure. Come on! Blue Falcon! Interestingly, they re-recorded this for Melee instead of importing the Smash 64 version, and it goes on to be used for Captain Falcon's Final Smash 2 and Brawl. Next one... Let's dance! An odd line for Marth to say considering he speaks exclusively in Japanese. But much like they gave Fox an English piece of dialogue, I wouldn't be surprised if they were experimenting with English dialogue for Marth 2, and this could have been used for a side B in fact. Otherwise, maybe it was unique dialogue meant for a potential Final Smash even. But speaking of potential Final Smashes... Booyah! Let's go! Both of which may just sound like regular, more unique grunts, but however have the Japanese word Kirifuda, which means trump card. Many speculate that this is actually the line for Ganondorf on Mario's Final Smash, because Kirifuda, which is short for Saigo no Kirifuda, is the Japanese name for Final Smash, which translates to the final trump card. So that is a possibility and maybe even a placeholder before being given a proper name like Captain Falcon's was. Next one. This was likely the sound effect that went along with that removed time bomb item that I mentioned earlier. And of course, an unused version of the Temple song exists too, with a more Ocarina of Time-esque sound. Also, there was a number of cut graphics in the game too. A big one is originally in All-Stars mode, every character was going to have a character intro featuring graphic of them across the screen. Likely removed since All-Stars mode isn't in the end just a one-on-one -on -one battle, and it's all still in the data too, but stays unused. Captain Falcon's alternate costume known as the Blood Falcon from his games was going to originally have the emblem of his vehicle, Hellhawk, on the back. Again, with Nintendo not wanting any religious references in their game, including the word Hell, this was removed. And within a few of the stages, we have a few and odd textures here and there. In Onet, behind the planter in front of the drugstore exists a small rice ball, which can be seen using a camera tool in fact. Among the textures for the plum trophy exists a picture of a gun. Really out of place and unsure what the intention was here. And this sushi board was found in amongst the textures of the Mushroom Kingdom stage. I have no idea what it was for. And as a bonus, Mr. Game & Watch isn't actually flat. He's fully round and only made flat using a coat to flatten him out. Yeah. This was indeed a game that was crammed full of content and done in only 13 months. And seeing how much was cut from the game too, it really shows how ambitious they were with it too. Once again, done by the genius and the hardest working man in Japan, Masahiro Sakurai. And it all paid off in the end, growing to such great popularity on a console that only sold 22 million units. Its popularity eventually spawned another sequel to feature a number of these cut ideas and even a story mode too, known as Super Smash Bros. Brawl. A game I plan to cover eventually, so hit that subscribe button for I'll plan to be back with more Smash Brothers and other cut content games too. And hit that like button too and comment below on what was your favorite piece of cut content. So everyone, thank you for watching!